Which brings us to why no one trusts the mainstream media. I'm really interested to see what PragerU has to say about this because I know why I don't trust the mainstream media. Um, but I'm curious why PragerU thinks no one does because it's amazing how badly PragerU can get things wrong. It's easy to scapegoat people, and that is what has always happened when there have been pandemics or epidemics uh, that foreigners are are attacked. Foreigners sometimes physically attacked. Uh, if you look at what happened, uh... yeah. Uh... Doug says, I think the biggest issue with PragerU specifically is they are pushing politics using media under the mask of education. And uh, the only thing I would say about this is that politics is in everything. So every educational institute is inherently political. Um, so I, I have no issue with a legitimate university using the model PragerU does. A lot of good could be done with that. Um, I don't know that we could get useful uh, factual information in a six-minute video, but a channel, uh, something like, um, oh, who, what's that one? Uh, SciShow? Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is the one, uh, Hank Green. Um, this is uh, more or less apolitical. Uh, Hank Green is pretty progressive, uh, but uh, this is... Actually, I should go ahead and subscribe to them. Uh, I am a terrible person. Uh, but they do a lot of real science videos, fairly short, as you can see. This is a good thing. Uh, if if PragerU was more like SciShow, they would I would be supporting them wholeheartedly. Unfortunately, um, they're not. Uh, PragerU lies. They spread propaganda. Uh, what they are is not a problem. It's what they do that's the problem. During the, the Middle Ages, there was lots and lots of scapegoating uh, against an ethnic group or a religious group uh, whenever there were pandemics that affected the society and frightened a lot of people. And uh, China certainly feels that is what, happen what is happening now uh, with people calling it the, the Wuhan flu or the Wuhan virus or the, the China virus. This is a virus that came from the territory of China, but came from bats. This is a bat virus, not a, uh, a China virus. Uh, it doesn't speak Chinese. It doesn't target Chinese people. Uh, it targets human beings who happen to touch their eyes, nose, or, or mouth. Trust in the media is at an all-time low, and for good reason. We in the business of journalism have exempted ourselves from the normal rules that used to govern us, and so the most egregious kinds of reporting errors are becoming more common. Okay, let's see who this bitch is. Cheryl Atkinson, American writer and host, TV show Full Measure with Cheryl Atkinson, uh, five-time Emmy Award winner. Okay. So looks like she used to be a good uh, reporter. Oh, anti-vaccine reporting. So she's an anti-vaxxer. That's fun. Always love to see that on the top. Uh, computer hacking claims that her personal work and personal and work computers have been compromised for more than two years. Uh, in, tw in her 2014 book, she wrote that a forensic examination revealed that her PC was hacked with keystroke logging spyware, enabling an intruder to read all her email messages and gain access to the passwords for her financial accounts. Yeah, she has little factual backing from anti-vax. True, Doug. Uh, she has, like, already that's... Uh, 2015, she appeared before the Senate Judiciary Committee... 
confirmation hearing for Loretta Lynch. Uh, photo committee. Pro we're not able to substantiate allegations that her computers were subject to remote intrusions by the FBI, other government personnel, or otherwise. So it looks like uh, she tried to claim that the government was hacking her. Yeah, so she's... Uh, it looks like someone who at one time had a, uh, a real journalism gig. Let's see where she's... She resigned from CBS News. Oh, God. I'm talking about free speech at universities. No safe spaces. Uh-huh. Oh, Atkinson's chart includes such websites as Infowar... Okay, yeah. So we know what she's like, even before she appeared on... Uh, uh, Prager you. Formerly well-respected news organizations and experienced national reporters are making the sorts of mistakes that wouldn't be tolerated in journalism school. When these mistakes are corrected at all, it's with seemingly little regret. And the corrections never get anywhere near as much attention as the original salacious but incorrect narrative. Well, no, because the websites you parrot, like InfoWars, will take any incorrect information and scream it across the airwaves, but will never rebroadcast the, uh, the correction. This is... And that's ignoring the uh, journalist organizations who will lie bald-facedly. <laughs> Like, just ignore factual reporting. How do we get here? I discuss that in detail in my book, The Smear. Here are three factors. First, firewalls that want... Here's the thing that really irritates me about PragerU. The number of their videos, which are pretty much just six-minute commercials for someone's book. There's been a lot of PragerU I've watched those basically... As I talk about in my book here, which basically means that this is a six-minute intro to their book. Once strictly separated news from opinion have been replaced by hopelessly blurred lines. Once forbidden practices such as editorializing within straight news reports and the inclusion of opinions as a fact are not only... T so I'm not a journalism major. I don't know how much of this is accurate, but from what I've heard, uh, from what I've, I've read, uh, doing these things is acceptable, uh, as long as you make it clear what is your opinion and what is your editorializing and what is not. Um, obviously, uh, a lot of the problems, uh, I've noticed is that, um, People take the opinion sections of news organizations and take that for the belief for the the ideological bent of the paper. So, like you, the, they'll show you a, a liberal piece from the New York Times and say, "See, all of their reporting has a liberal bias." But if you actually look at the reporting, the actual journalistic reporting is fairly unbiased. But everyone just reads the opinion section because that's where the, the fiery takes are. Tolerated, they're encouraged. The result, it's never been... And the reason for this is that it, it gives uh, pieces some uh, humanity. It lets people be more connected to their... Uh, to the, the piece and to the event than without such things. Um, whether that is actually good or bad thing is an exercise best left to the individual. Um, but there, there is a reason for these things. It's been harder for Americans to separate news that's real from news that's not. This is a different problem. This is uh, uh, the rise of fake news and the, uh, the rise of people being... Uh, people putting out news that has a veneer of factualness, but isn't. 
These are two different issues. She has officially abandoned one position that is potentially defensible for a position which is not. Example, May 14th, 2016, 10 days after Donald Trump became the Republican presidential nominee, the New York Times published a blockbuster article titled Crossing the Line, How Donald Trump Behaved with Women in Private. Thank you for my example. Let me see. Cross the line and more. Okay. So. Uh, fuck off, New York Times. I'll give you enough of my time. So this is in the politics section, U.S. politics. So this is uh, uh, not in the opinion section. But let's take a look at... Uh, the, we're not going to read the whole thing, but we'll read through enough to get an idea of it. So, Donald was having a pool party at Mar-a-Lago. So, this is a direct quote from this person. At the time, a 26-year-old model did it. Threw him triangle. So, Mr. Trump, then 44, and in the midst of his first divorce, decided to show her off to the crowd at Mar-a-Lago. His estate, blah, blah, blah. That is a stunning Trump girl, isn't it? The words evoke a familiar cascade of casual insults hurled from the safe distance of a Twitter account, a radio show, or campaign podium. All of this is absolutely true. Trump is renowned for his insults uh, towards everyone, but his misogyny is probably second only to his racism. Uh... So if she's, if this uh, uh, Atkinson woman is going to try to convince us that this is all a smear job uh, because it's literally talking to people who believe he was, uh, who felt uh, harassed by him, well, so. The story's authors, Michael Barbaro and Megan Tuohy, interviewed Roanne Lane, an ex-girlfriend of Trump's. Her quotes made Trump sound at best like a jerk and at worst like a predator. The reporters went so far as to provide their own quotes for the story, presenting their personal commentary as if it were established fact, writing... Okay, let's see where that is. Uh, so fine. Okay, so Barbaro never said anything. All right. So let's let's see what her example is. This is the public treatment of some women by Mr. Trump, degrading, impersonal, performed. The problem is the reporting wasn't true, according to Trump's supposed victim. Once the story was published, she publicly accused the Times of misleading her, writing a hit piece against Trump, and putting a negative connotation on what she... Okay. So let's check this. Uh... You know what we can check... The comments. Always check the comments, people. Okay. A woman changing. Yeah, so here is a woman who uh, was praised for her work ability. Uh. Yeah, so even she doesn't, again, assuming this is true, uh, okay, never mind.
let's just see. Uh, you know what? Never mind. She said it was not a negative experience. So again, this is a situation where uh, a person can describe a situation which they believe is a uh, darkness 5632. Uh, I am not well versed in European politics. Uh, I, the only country that exists is America. So that is my position on that. I'm sorry. Uh, but p as I was saying, people can uh, view two situations differently depending on how they uh, how they believe uh, the world exists and things like that. So for instance, uh, someone can view a situation as pleasant, whereas another person viewing that situation from outside, uh, sees uh, harassment or even abuse. So, this could all be true. There could very well have been a woman who Trump uh, showed off and was did all these things to, which were editorialized by the authors of the, uh, the New York Times article. Uh, all of this could be true. Um, and she views it as a very positive situation. But the way he behaved towards her could have still been disgusting. These two things can be true simultaneously. So, let's see what else No matter have to where say. you stand, this was a huge development in terms of journalism. The main source behind front page national news discredited the, the entire premise of the story. You'd expect something like that to rock the whole news organization and prompt investigations of retraction and re-examination of policies. Yet I can find no record of any of that. The Times and their reporters... Okay. Let me look for this, because something smells fishy here. Uh, let's see. Rowan Brewer Lane. Politico. Eh, Politico is pretty decent. Should I have this different debate and face to face encounter between Mr. Trump and a young woman he hardly knew? Right. Brewer Lane appeared on Fox and Friends to dispute the Times framing uh, of her account. They promised several times that they would do it accurately. They told me several times and my manager several times that it would not be a hit piece and that my story would come across the way that I was telling it. And honestly, and it absolutely was not. So let's look at her quotes. Donald was having a pool party at Mar-a-Lago. There were about 50 models and 30 men. There were girls in the pool, splashing around. For some reason, Donald seemed a little smitten with me. He just started talking to me and nobody else. He suddenly took me by the hand and he started to show me around the mansion. He asked me... Uh, if I had a swimsuit with me, I said no. I hadn't intended to swim. He took me into a room and opened drawers and asked me to put on a swimsuit. Okay. Um, I mean, that's a little weird. We don't know uh, how long they'd been together. But, you know, okay. Came out, he said, wow. Uh... So again, 26-year-old model, 44-year-old, uh, uh, wealthy. This is definitely a situation where uh, Ms. Brewer Lane may, uh, may have uh, done things that she wouldn't normally have done. Let's put it that way. Um, That is a stunning Trump girl, isn't it? Yeah, referring to anyone as a Trump girl or, or uh, the, the classic Bond girl, that's pretty sexist. 
Uh, you're basically saying that they have value only as their connection to uh, a person. Like, this is a bad statement, even if Ms. Brewer Lane was proud of it. That that's that's what I'm referring to. This is the public dream of someone by Mr. Trump, the presumptive Republican nominee for president, degrading and personal performed. That must be a pretty picture, you dropping to your knees, he told a female contestant on the celebrity App apprentice. Rosie O'Donnelly said had a fat, ugly face. A lawyer who needed to pump milk for a newborn? Disgusting. So, I will admit that there definitely is some bias in this, uh, some anti-Trump bias. Um, but it is stating uh, the facts uh, using his quotes. So, uh, degrading... I, I think that uh, telling a female contestant, uh, that must be a pretty picture you dropping to your knees that's pretty degrading i think we can agree that uh that telling a woman that you would look pretty dropping to your knees uh is pretty degrading um rosie o'donnell has a fat ugly face uh insulting definitely uh, degrading maybe uh but definitely insulting and a lawyer who needed to pump milk for a newborn? Disgusting. So these are all characterizing Trump using his quotes describing the situation. There is some bias here, but not, uh, not an overwhelming bias. Also, if you don't want to be labeled a shithead, don't say shitty things. Then in the episode at Mar-a-Lago, Mrs. Brewer Lane described as different. So here is where uh, we have our first true editorializing, I feel. Uh, a debasing face-to-face -face encounter between Mr. Trump and a young woman he hardly knew. So here is here are the authors describing a... Uh, uh, an encounter as debasing based on the description of it. Now, obviously she apparently didn't find it debasing. It was fine. But I think we can all agree that uh, telling a woman you apparently barely met to immediately change into a bikini and then describing her as a Trump girl is pretty debasing. Uh, okay, the New York Times interviewed dozens of women who had worked with or for Mr. Trump over the past four decades in the worlds of real estate, modeling, and pageants. Women who had dated him or interacted with him socially, and women and men who closely observed his contacts since his adolescence. In all, more than 50 interviews were conducted over the course of six weeks. Their accounts, many relayed here in their own words, reveal unwelcome romantic advances, unending commentary on the female form, a shrewd reliance on ambitious women, and unsettling workplace conduct, according to the interviews, as well as court records and written rec recollections. So, this video is making it seem like they're using just this uh, Rowan Brewer Lane's testimony to smear Trump whereas so far it was the introduction and there was some editorializing but the actual description of her position of, of what happened was you know not awful uh, the closest we get is this right here a debasing face to face encounter and again I think we can agree however she felt about it it was debasing so, what emerges from the interviews is a complex, at times contradictory portrait of a wealthy, well-known, and provocative man and the woman, women around him, one that defies simple categorization. Some women found him gracious and encouraging. He promoted several to the loftiest heights of his company, a daring move for a major real estate developer at the time. See, so even with the bias, they're, they're making sure to point out the positive things Trump did, promoting women at a time when that was unheard of, uh... And 
uh, that Trump is not all bad. Yes, yes, I know, orange man bad. But, uh, but really, the what they're saying here is that he's kind of shitty in some situations, but not always. Eh, you know. He simultaneously nurtured women's careers and mocked their physical appearance. You like your candy, he told an overweight female executive who oversaw the construction of his headquarters in midtown Manhattan. He could be lewd one moment and gentlemanly the next. This... Okay, so once again, I am vindicated. The New York Times uh, journalism is not hyper biased, uh, and Prager U is lying once again. What a shocker. Never even apologized or printed a correction. Second, though. We because they didn't need to correct anything may personally like or dislike a politician as journalists were obligated to treat them the same. Too often, that's not the case. For example, in May 2008, then-presidential candidate Barack Obama said he had visited 57 states. Since there are only 50 states, everyone knew what he meant. He meant to say that he had visited 47 states. The remark, nothing more than a verbal gaffe, drew little attention, and it didn't deserve more. But when Sarah Palin made a comparable gaffe, saying... I remember something more about that. Because, yes, uh, Sarah Palin suffered from uh, a lot of SNL abuse. Uh, and a lot of people thinking that things that Tina Fey said were... Uh, things that she actually said but she still had no business being anywhere near so fake news media that's right Trump bringing it back up is what I remember okay yes and uh, of course she's going to ignore all the times when uh, the uh, conservative media might have blown things out of proportion, such as when uh, they gave Obama so much shit for asking for Dijon mustard, or when he uh, had the audacity to wear a tan suit, or when Obama, who has never been in the armed forces, never claimed to be in the armed forces, uh, saluted someone getting onto Air Force One with his Starbucks. Uh, if you really think that's important, you really need to get a life. <laughs> Let's finish this up. We've got to stand with our North Korean allies. She was relentlessly ridiculed and mocked in the media. Even though yes, because that's not a slip up. Knowing, so, <coughs> so knowing the difference between North and South Korea is pretty important and also a pretty simple mistake to make. But it's the kind of mistake that uh, is important. Like, <coughs> Saying 57 states, uh, that could have been, in, uh, in fact, actually, let me, because I think it was actually, like, an exaggeration. Like, he was deliberately being, uh, hyperbolic. Because people of both parties... And people who don't have a party affiliation should be concerned with our current course, should be concerned about the basic institutions of our democracy, should want to see a restoration of honesty. Oh, here and it is. And Never mind. Uh, because, you know, it is just wonderful to be back in Oregon. And over the last 15 months, we've traveled uh, to every corner of the United States. Uh, I've now been in 57 states, 
I think, one left to go. Uh, one left to go. Uh, Alaska and Hawaii I was not allowed to go to, even though I really wanted to visit, but my staff would not uh, justify it. So, yeah, uh, that was that didn't seem to be deliberate hyperbole. I take that back. Um, but let's let's look at the context for Palin's North Korea gaffe. So, okay, the Guardian. Yeah, Palin never claimed she could see Russia from her house. That was Tina Fey. She had one better on Glenn Beck's radio show in discussing the ten tensions in the Korean Peninsula and saying, we've got to stand with our North Korean allies. So this came out, okay, this is 2010, November of 2010. So the campaign hadn't even, no, the campaign was, she was done campaigning. Uh, yeah, I'm okay with that. Fuck off. Um, mixing up North and South Korea is much, much bigger deal than 57 states. And keep in mind, I'm not defending Obama because I love Obama. Obama was a piece of shit. Deporter-in-chief, drone striker-in-chief... Obama, no love here. Everyone knew she meant to say South Korean allies. Third, too many of us have allowed ourselves to become tools of politicians and spinmeisters, often in order to get something in return. I call this transactional journalism. Example, emails show... Welcome to capitalism, folks. Everything's a market, therefore everything's for sale. Uh, this, that, that's the problem. You create, uh, you, you believe that everything runs on in a market, therefore everything is for sale, so you can't get mad when people start selling things, including their opinions and their journalistic integrity. That said, you can still get mad at the people who sell those things, but we should be attacking the system and not, you know not the system. In July 2009, the Atlantic reporter Mark Amender was promised a scoop. He'd get an advanced copy of a speech by then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, but only if he followed certain conditions as privately dictated by Clinton aide Philippe Rines. Rines. Yeah, Hillary's corrupt and I'm honestly not sure so basically, this means that he gets to have his article, uh, very true, Doug, everything has a price, uh, but only if followed by certain, so basically, Hillary was saying, uh, I'll let you have, uh, the first article, Yeah, inside scoop is more likely paid for this in advance. Yeah, that's what this is. They were offering him the inside scoop uh, if he followed certain directions. Let's see what those conditions were. Emailed Ambiter precise instructions, including describe Clinton's voice as muscular and don't say you were blackmailed, by which Clinton aide Rhines obviously meant don't reveal our arrangement. Got it, replied Ambiter. So... This is where we get into class collaboration and uh, why I've seen certain people uh, uh, talk about how the difference between the Democrats and Republicans is that the Republicans are, this is the biggest issue with capitalism and legal contracts. Yeah, everything being for sale is definitely one of the major problems with capitalism. Uh but uh, the, Dem the Republican Party are all but openly fascist at this point, and the Democrats just keep it on the down low. Yep. Yeah, this is... So, 
this is something that has gone on for years where someone will mail out a well someone will contact a reporter or they might even just have a reporter on file so to speak on retainer um and uh so they go out and they go to this reporter and they explain hey uh i've got a a a speech or i know this thing is going to happen or that thing or this other thing uh you know i'll give you the details on it but you know you have to and what the you have to can be anything from don't push this angle or like this make sure her uh describe her voice as muscular uh which tells me that the instructions were probably something like just make sure you describe her speech as make sure you describe her as strong uh July of 2009 just to puff her up uh, we're seeing a lot of this crap right now. Why do you think only certain people are reporting Trump and key individuals right now? We see Trump doing nothing about COVID and every other politician. Yes, yes. Funniest thing I saw on Twitter, it was like, uh, um, uh, I just watched CNN, COVID coverage. Uh, MSNBC, COVID coverage. Uh, Fox News, spring and salad recipes. Spring salad channel, COVID news coverage the 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 only the only people who are uh ignore the the only organizations ignoring this are is the republican mouthpiece um there are a lot of people reporting on trump um but a lot of people are not reporting uh Accurately or harshly enough, in my opinion. And that's the problem, is that states do not have the resources. Uh, so Doug also says states are running the show more than Trump in regards to COVID. This is true. Uh, the states are running the show, um, which is the problem. States don't have the resources to deal with, uh, under our federal federal federalization federated governmental system the states don't have the resources to deal with this uh but the reality is of course trump wants businesses to handle it and he wants to be able to just give government money to businesses uh news is about what people are willing to buy trump isn't getting the light because he isn't acting so they aren't showing the what he's not doing with which is an issue Yes, uh, a lot of, uh, now I don't watch a lot of mainstream media, a lot of MSNBC or CNN, but the feeling I get from it is that uh, there's a lot of Trump is being shown to be trying to do something, and they're not. He's, he's what he's trying to do is get another big-ass bailout for the billionaires, and we're not going to take it this time because we know what happens when you give the billionaires a bunch of money. They fire people. His resulting article reads in part, when you think of President Obama's foreign policy, think of Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. That's the message behind a muscular speech that Clinton is set to deliver today. Yeah. Allocated funds that we have limits, states digging, federals wanting to release reserves into business, and Dems trying to block the shit from going straight to the top. Uh, what the Dems are doing is trying to, uh, they're trying to um, means test it. Uh, it's not that they are opposed to it going to the people. It's that they want to make it like a tax credit or something. Um, but uh, we've also got all the businesses who are being hit by the, I mean, legitimately losing money, uh, with their hands out to the, to the government saying, Hey, we need money to bail us out. Yeah. It's the same trickle down economics. Uh, so Doug is saying here, um, we're seeing blocking because the top 1% wants the money and they aren't going to let it go to businesses. 
uh, but they keep pushing businesses. Yes, because the uh, the neoliberal uh, and neoconservative framework is to give money to the top, and then the people at the top will reinvest that into the economy, and thus everything goes better. Problem is, we know that isn't what happens. We give the money to the top, and they say, cool, more money for us, and then it goes into a, a stock or a savings account or something like that somewhere. That Ambender, then considered a serious journalist, would allegedly violate basic ethics for such a minor story speaks volumes about the state of today's news media. And they're being hypocritical because literally every journalist has almost guaranteed taken a deal like that uh, where they get a scoop. Yeah, exactly, versus giving them money, they keep it. Exactly. For the record, Ammender defended himself by saying that he found Clinton's speech to be muscular, so the adjective was appropriate. I think most Americans would like to believe their news is factual, well-researched, and untainted by a reporter's opinion. To put it another way, they want their news straight up. Again, this is, this is the problem that when we put our... When, when journalists put their own editorializing in, most people see it as their own, uh, their own opinion on it. Like, even if it was totally made up and he didn't think her voice sounded muscular, saying that adds to the tone of the piece. So, and every article is a story. Even if you're just stating facts, you're still creating a narrative. But too often now, that's not what they're getting, and they know it. I'm frequently asked, can the news be fixed? The answer is yes, but the first step to fixing a problem is admitting that we have one. Until we do that, nothing can change. I'm Cheryl Ackeson for Prager uh, News. Yeah. So, yeah, the problem is capitalism. The problem is that... Uh, there is no real oversight to journalism except for their editors. And given that, uh, especially in the last 10 years or so, editors are more focused on eyeballs and click-throughs. So, um, yeah, that, that's the problem. Uh, everything's a market, everything's for sale.